Are you ready? Jesus is coming back. Are you ready? Would you ask the person next to you if they're ready? Okay. Well, we need to be ready because Jesus is coming back. Now, if you really believe that, I believe you get all your concerns, your main thoughts, upwards. Don't worry what's happening in the world. You will never change it. I can't change it either. The devil's having this attack. Why? He knows that Jesus is coming back soon. We need to be ready. Okay? It's very, very important. Now, I assume you've all been watching the news lately. Some of you don't watch the news, but I do. I want to know what's happening in the world. Okay? Now, if you've been watching the news, we've all watched the terrible devastation being inflicted upon the Ukraine. All right? Now, since Russia rolled its military across the border in an attempt to overthrow Ukraine's government, attacking and killing innocent people along the way. Now, a lot of people have been killed. You know that. Now, Christians need to be watching these end-time events unfold very carefully. We need to understand the background cause behind all of these conflicts. And we need to pray for those in the Ukraine because they are suffering. I'm sure Russian people don't want this conflict either. Many of them don't. Many of them have been locked up for opposing the government. We can see the Russian bear is trying to expand his empire. There's no doubt about it. And many Christians are wondering if Russia's attack on the Ukraine is foretold in Bible prophecy. No, it's not. I believe this invasion falls into one of the ten end time signs that Jesus gave in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. Jesus foretold that as we get closer to his return, and we're getting very close, there would be an increase in wars and rumors of wars. All right? Now, Matthew 24, verse 6 to 7 says this, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, See that you are not troubled. You're not troubled, are you? For all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. So Russia's invasion of the Ukraine fits in with this scripture in Matthew about the increase of wars and rumors of wars, right? But it is not a specific war that's been prophesied in the Bible. I don't believe that this war is directly tied to what we have, the Gog and Magog war that is mentioned in the Bible, okay? In the book of Ezekiel, in the Old Testament, and that was written 571 years ago, B.C., that is, before Christ, by the prophet Ezekiel. Over half of this prophetic book contains promises about Israel's future. And even though we're seeing all of the nations and the peoples mentioned in the books of Ezekiel, verse 38 and 39 especially, which are Iran, Turkey, Sudan, Libya, and so forth, beginning to be stirred up. And I'm sure you've seen the stirring up in the last several months, okay? Okay. And it could go towards the land of Israel very quickly, and it's not at this very moment. And for those not familiar with end times, now it's important you get some basic understanding about end times. Very important. Now most churches do not teach you about end times. You know why? They've never studied it. And it should be studied. It's the last book in the Bible that tells us of the coming of Jesus Christ again. And we need to understand where we stand all right? Now, now, for those not familiar with the end times, 
I'll just briefly mention that in the book of Ezekiel, chapters 38 and 39, it does speak about a war called the Gog and Magog War. And it goes into great detail about how a leader from Russia, a man designated as Gog, leads Iran and the Sudan and Libya and all the Stan nations like Afghanistan, Pakistan, all those nations that have the letters S-T-A-N in their name. All those nations. Hmm. Turkey will join together in an attempt to plunder and destroy Israel. Now, that hasn't happened yet. But you know on the border of Israel, most of those nations are there already, causing problems. But we are seeing Russia getting its power back. So it can one day lead a multinational coalition. That's what they're after. Russia's attack on the Ukraine shows that the Russian bear has not lost its teeth, as most believed it had become. The timing of Russia's invasion is interesting because it seems like Putin and the hostile world powers were just waiting for the United States to pull out of Afghanistan, which we've all seen the witness of that, which they totally made a mess of. All right? The pullout from Afghanistan showed the whole world how weak the American leadership is. And so far it appears then that both NATO and the United States are not going to do anything to stop Putin other than to throw economic sanctions at him. All since they lost their base in Afghanistan. And that was an embarrassment too. NATO, right now, is no more than a paper tiger. Putin may have a viable reason for being concerned that NATO has been moving one country at a time closer and closer to their border. And, you know, we've got to look at it overall, that's true. Now, he may fear NATO encroaching up to a point where it can eventually launch a takeover of Russia. But I do not believe NATO is interested in invading Russia. Okay? Now, economically speaking, why does Russia want Ukraine anyhow? Because Ukraine really, and it's become more and more knowledgeable from the reports now, that it is the bread basket of Eastern Europe. And it really is. The nation which possesses great material wealth. It also has a natural gas pipeline going into Europe from Russia. Goes through there. 40% of Putin's economy is based on the sale of oil and gas to Europe. So it's essential that Russia controls that pipeline. Makes sense. Now, also, there are historic reasons why Russia is wanting to pull Ukraine back within its sphere of influence. Can you see that map? You can see the Ukraine there. Hallelujah, see Belarus above it. Okay, now, why do they want that so much? It's very, very important that you understand that. Just have a good look at that map for a moment. Now, the historic reasons why Russia is pulling, wanting to pull Ukraine back within its sphere of influence, you see that map? Most people don't know that when Stalin was in power, now you've got to understand, because I've heard some people debate some of this stuff, and they really don't know history properly. If you're going to give influence to people, make sure you understand the background correctly. Now I study in times all the time, and you never stop learning. It's very complicated, and we need to have a sound understanding and knowledge of what the Word of God is saying. All right? Stalin, when he was in power, he starved uh, over three and a half million Ukrainians. Did you know that? And then repopulated those areas in eastern portion of that nation with Russians. Okay? Putin has been saying that he's invading to liberate these Russians being held hostage by the Ukrainian government. But the fact is, these Russians had been moved onto Ukrainian soil in a Russian attempt to take over more and more of that land. 
And Mr. Putin, some of his allies would like to destabilize the West, very much so. The West has become so weak, I, th I think it's embarrassing. Putin believes now is the best time to pounce, and that's what he's done. And it opens the way for Russia to get through the Ukraine, through the Crimea, and then he gets him closer and closer to the Mediterranean and gives them another access, when it's, if it was necessary, to Israel. They say, why, why are they interested in Israel? Because Israel has got natural oil, lots of it, just out into the sea and from their land, and natural gas. They've got some of the best stuff in the world right now. Okay? Now, many of the European nations have become very dependent upon Russian energy. They're now suffering the consequences for making such an alliance. Now, God wants us, Christians, to be aware what's going on in the world around us. Would you agree that's very important? Well, it is. And most of all, he doesn't want us to be fearful when we see some of these signs of the end. Jesus said in Luke 21, verse 28, Look up, because our redemption, the rapture, that is, he's speaking of, would be very close at hand. And it's got to be very close at hand because our time is almost up. The years are there. We've, it's done. You're the last generation to see all these things happen before Jesus returns for his church. All right? So one of these days, only God knows, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back for his church. And at a moment when the world is least expecting it, he's going to appear in the clouds to those of us who are true believers and catch us away to glory to be with him forever. Oh, you should be happy about that. That is going to be a very, very exciting moment. Amen. Praise God. And according to the Bible, as Christians, we are living in the awareness that it is rapidly approaching. So Titus 2.13 says... We're to live every day looking for that blessed hope. Do you hear that? Every day looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We should be, praise God, looking up, knowing our Savior is coming soon. So if that's the case, are you going to get worried about the world affairs? Are you going to be more concerned for looking up? We will never stop what's going to happen on this earth. You can't. All right? We can only believe we're getting out of here. So we've got to be ready all the time. The outward call for that last trumpet, because before very long now, that trumpet is going to sound. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52 tells us, It will happen in a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when that trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever, and we who are living will also be transformed. All of us need to be reminded of that. Otherwise, we tend to get overly occupied with the natural things of this earth. Christians do that too. We start thinking things the way they are right now are going to continue forever, but they are not. This age is like a book, and we're coming to the end of the book. You're in the last chapter right now. It has a final page that says, the end. Hallelujah. When we get to that page, if we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we're going to take off with him and begin a wonderful new adventure. In the meantime, according to the Bible, we're to look forward to that adventure. Are you excited about leaving? He will be when you go. But get excited now. We're to stir up our anticipation because that anticipation has a powerful effect on how we live. Now 1 John 3, 3 says, the believer who focus on the hope of Jesus appearing all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. 
He's expecting commitment, dedication. He runs his race here on the earth in such a way that at the end, this is how it should be, he can say, like what the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, this is what we should all be able to say, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. And I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And that prize is not just for me, but for all. I'd like to think it's all of you here today, eagerly looking forward to his appearance. That's all in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 to 8. Now, wouldn't you like that to be your testimony? I want it to be my testimony when I stand before him someday, because we told we're going to stand before him. I want him to be able to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen? Now, if you love the Lord, then that's what you want to hear too, isn't it? Don't you want him to say that to you? Of course you do. Praise God. Well, when the last trumpet for the church sounds, you don't want to realize you haven't yet gotten around to doing what Jesus called you to do. And it's time for the church to get stirred up. Not just the ministers. Every one of you are a minister for God. You're a representative on this earth right now. You're an ambassador and a king and a priest for him. That's what the Bible tells me. Amen? So you want to know you've been fulfilling your assignment. So you'll have confidence, not be ashamed before him at his coming, according to 1 John 2, 28. You want to have been living and walking with him every day, so you're excited and you're ready to meet him. Now, if you're not ready when that time comes, it will be too late to do anything about it. You won't be able to convince Jesus to change his schedule for you. Hmm? He won't be able to give you a few more years to prepare for his return. No, I believe the time of his coming has already been set. God has already fixed an appointed date for it, and he's never late. He always keeps his appointments right on time. That's just the way he operates. Now, God set an appointed time for Jesus to come the first time, didn't he? And at that appointed time, he was born a man into this earth. He set an appointed time for Jesus to come back for his church too. You and I can rest assured now. That's going to happen too, right on time. Acts 17 Verse 30 to 31 tells us this. Therefore, God is now declaring to men and women that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through his man, Jesus, whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. But you might say, well, that verse is talking about a fixed date when God will judge the world. Now, in the Bible, that's the time called the tribulation, when things on this earth are going to get really bad. You won't want to be around for that. And you won't be if you're truly born again. All right? You'll be caught up beforehand to be with Jesus. We call that the rapture the taking out, the snatching away of the believers. Because you've already been made and judged righteousness in him. He's going to snatch you out of here. Aren't you glad? Before the final season of the world judgment begins. I know some don't believe that. Well, you're entitled to believe what you like. I believe that. All right? Now... At that time, as 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 to 17 says, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's from the time of the cross all the way through for all those who believed. All right? Then we which are alive, that's us today, 
and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall be ever be with the Lord. So I want to encourage you. You will get a supernatural body. Every woman, you look beautiful. All the wrinkles will go, everything. As guys will get our hair back properly and we'll look good too. All right? Now I'm serious. You get a new recreated supernatural body. That's worth look, you know, getting excited about. Now, I do want to encourage you because in recent times we've seen droughts, bushfires, floods, the COVID disease, and wars. But as I read at the beginning, you're going to escape the judgment coming on the earth. Now, just to show you what the Bible says, let me ask you a question. Where can the church be found in the book of Revelation? You think about this. Where is the church mentioned in the book of Revelation? Up to the first few chapters. Hmm? Because it relates to our expectation of the imminent rapture of the church. Meaning, all who are saved are collectively called the Bride of Christ. First, the book opens stating that it is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants. Revelations 1 verse 1. Now, in verse 4, John addresses seven churches in Asia, right? And chapter 2 and 3 consist of Jesus' letters to those churches. Now, Jesus' messages to those individual churches are all relevant for us today. The churches themselves are representatives of different types of churches, all right? Different levels of maturity, different levels of commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they do offer a prophetic overview of the church age as it has progressed from the beginning of the last 2,000 years. Okay? Then at the beginning of chapter 4, the scene totally changes. John, who was on the Isle of Patmos, heard a voice that called, or raptured him up to heaven. He went up to heaven. He hadn't died. He was immediately transported into the spirit, in the spirit, to the throne room of God himself. Now the next 14 chapters describe the tribulation period in great detail. But there is no mention of the church by name or by description. You won't find it. Why is the church absent throughout John's record of God's wrath being poured out upon the earth? Well, that's a good question. You need to answer it to yourself. And don't make excuses. It's not mentioned. Because God has promised the church she will be delivered from the wrath to come. Now, you're quite welcome to stay for the wrath. You can deny God that pleasure of taking you out. I don't want to do that. Because the Bible tells me those seven years are the worst seven years ever, ever been on this earth. Now, if you were living in Ukraine right now, you'd want to be out if you could. And look at the 6,000 Jews and the other thousands who were killed just in the Second World War by a maniac. Come on, friends. That's our generation we've lived in. But before that, there's always been evil things. You need to look at history and read history all the way through and be thankful you live in this nation right now. We've never seen real persecution. And praise God, I hope we never will. We'd be out of here. Why is the church absent throughout John's record of God's wrath being poured out upon this earth? Because God has promised the church that she will be delivered from the wrath to come. Now you can have it. I'm not having it. I'm going. If he promises that, I believe him. Even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come, Romans 5.9 says, Therefore, since we are now justified, acquitted, made righteous, brought into right relationship with God by Christ's blood, how much more certain is it that we shall be saved by him from the indignation and the wrath of God? Colossians 3.4 
When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Well, if we're going to appear with him, we've got to go from glory too and come with him. Revelation 3.10 Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you. I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now, some have misunderstood the 21 judgments unleashed by God on the earth during the tribulation as the wrath of Satan. I want to tell you something. It is not the wrath of Satan. That's not biblical. Paul revealed the wrath of God will fall upon the sons of disobedience. Meaning those who have rejected Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, 6. All right? If Jesus is called the bridegroom, we're the bride, do you really think your bridegroom is going to beat you up? Beat up the bride by making her go through the tribulation? That doesn't sound like God to me. What kind of God are you serving if you believe that kind of stuff? Hmm? Just before gathering her to his father's house, and we'll look at that passage of scripture just a little later, a second point here, pointing to the absence of the church during the tribulation, is found in the wording of the message to the seven churches. To everyone, Jesus says, He who has an ear, hear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Notice as he says, He who has an ear, let him hear. Later when John is describing the dragon on the earth, you know, the false prophet and the beast from the sea, the Antichrist who's going to set up, he merely says this, If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Revelation 13, 9. Okay, when Jesus is speaking to the churches, he says, He who has an ear. We can hear what the Spirit of God is saying. But when the church is gone, Jesus is saying, If... Anyone? Is there anyone out there listening? The book of Revelation clearly communicates that God's wrath will be poured out on a rebellious, unrepentant world. That's true. Those who have rejected Jesus Christ will recognize that fact. For John records that they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Revelation 6, 15 to 16. Now the third point is the reappearance of the church in Revelation 19 when John records the marriage of the Lamb and his bride. Following the marriage supper of the Lamb, the bride of Christ will then follow Jesus as he returns, this time in glory. Reason? To defeat Satan and his reign upon this earth. Now the bottom line is that the church, including all of us who are collectively called the Bride of Christ, does not need to fear God's wrath. Soon and very soon, the Heavenly Father will tell the bridegroom, go and get your bride. And I reckon Jesus is preparing himself right now in the heavens to do that. Okay, he's waiting for that call. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 to 17 again says this, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, we are not supposed to be like the people in the world system who will be taken by surprise by Jesus coming. And it's sad to say many churches will never tell you about the end times. That's really sad. It says that day will come upon them as a thief in the night. They'll be shocked by it, as the unbelievers were in Noah's day, when the flood swept through the earth, as Jesus said. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage. So all things are going to continue in those areas. Amen. Until the day, it says, that Noah entered into the ark.
did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. He was totally obedient for a hundred years. Did you know that? He went into that ark. God closed the door. The two men in will be in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at a mill, it says. One will be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, and be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So be ready. What does it mean to be ready? Well, according to the dictionary, it means to be prepared or equipped to act immediately. Okay? Shall I say it again? Be prepared or equipped to act immediately. It means to be like the Israelites were on the night before God delivered them out of Egypt. They were prepared to act immediately and leave that place. Exodus 12, 11 tells us in the Bible, they were doing what the Lord had commanded, eating the Passover meal with their traveling clothes on, their shoes laced up, and their walking sticks in their hands. They were ready. They were all obedient. Now we know the whole world is not obedient. I know the whole church is not obedient because, well, different levels of the church, they're not told these things. They're not told or expressed the word of God. We need the word of God like never before. They were ready to go. Now that's how we as believers need to live all the time. Let me just say this. What are your main concerns right now? Is it to build another house? Is it to increase your business? Or, you know, hey, you don't have much time left. It's best just to be dependent where you are and know that you, you're all right. You've made it. God's going to take care of you. Things are going to change big time in this world. Very, very soon. Surely you've seen it changing. Amen. We need to consecrate, dedicate every ounce of our being, every moment we have, and everything we do to the Lord's service. Amen. We need to get rid of anything. Anything at all that would hinder us from walking in the Spirit. So we can be immediately, this is what God requires, to be available to do whatever the Lord tells us. After all, we are in the last days and he's doing great things right now. He's going to pour out his Spirit and gather in the last great harvest of souls on this earth. We don't want to miss out on that because we're out there in the world you know, somewhere doing our own thing, not really interested in what's really going to take place. Amen. And God is pouring out his spirit somewhere. Well, we should desire to be in the middle of it all. I praise God that I live on the Gold Coast. I, 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 I believe God's going to do something powerful on this coast before it's too late. We've got to want to be doing our part in the plan and the work of God. If we're doing that, when that trumpet sounds and Jesus appears in the clouds, we'll know exactly what's happening and we'll be ready to go. Amen? We can be like Noah was when the flood came. He was preparing when the rain started to fall. Now you remember, it was just as way out in Noah's day as it is in our day in a different sense. They'd never seen rain. They didn't have sea. And the good point is, when God comes back, we're not going to have a sea again. We've got more land. He's going to recreate it all, as it should have been. That's interesting, isn't it? See, Noah wasn't in the dark about what was going on. He was in the ark. Amen. God took him out. He raised him up, didn't he, above the waters. He was safe, dry, and ready to sail. Now, Jesus gave us another vivid picture of this kind of readiness in Matthew 25, verse 1 to 8, that I mentioned before. Jesus said, Then the kingdoms of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Keep listening to this. You'll learn something in a minute. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. 
Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. At midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. Now think about those foolish virgins, just for a moment, who decided they weren't going to take any oil. They did. It was their decision, wasn't it? They made the choice not to be prepared. When the bridegroom came, they realized they'd made a mistake. But by then, it was too late to correct it. They asked the wise virgins to help them. Matthew 25, verse 9. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. We just don't know the day and hour. We know the season. And for those who are learned, they know we're, we're really in the end of the season. It's coming to an end. Now one thing this parable makes very clear is that when it comes to being ready for you in the air, meeting with Jesus, when it comes to being dedicated and consecrated to him, no one else can do that for you. I can't do it for you. Your husband or wife can't do it for you. It's your responsibility to see to it yourself that you are fully prepared. God will help you with that preparation, of course. He'll strengthen you. He wants to speak to you through his written word. He'll teach you. He'll lead you by the Holy Spirit. But now, and the time that Jesus comes, he'll provide you with everything you need to do what you're called to do. Okay? But you have got to cooperate with him. You have to be watching. You need to be listening to what he's saying to you on the inside, into your spirit. You've got to be attending to his word, praying and walking with him day by day. He may have a work for you to do that you don't even know about yet. I'm sure that many of you are like that. Well, what does he want me to do? There'll be something. But if you give him access to your time, he will tell you about it. He'll show you the steps you need to take and help you to fulfill his plan. So watch and pray and be quick to obey. That's what God wants. Do what God is calling you to do and stay ready because Jesus is coming soon. You just don't know the day or the hour. You should know if you've been a Christian for a while, you are now in the midnight hour. He's coming.